Hey guys, Jesse here, not Eric Edstrom as my name on screen shows. Was, um, we had to have Eric that, with us it? somehow, but uh, no, I'm we're Jesse. So professional. Welcome to Seeking What They Sought. Uh, today we're here with Justin. Justin is a, a social media influencer who is um, using the evil the evil uh, media of social media <laughs> to indoctrinate the youths for Jesus. Uh, did I get that right, Justin? Does that <laughs> yes. sound correct? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty accurate. The youths, uh, the youths. definitely Jesus. trying to target the youths Perfect. using social media. So good. Justin's been a, a social media influ influencer for a while. In fact, I think you were probably one of the first Christian influencers, one of the, like the, the beginning group of Christian influencers that saw that social media could be used um, for for uh, evangelism or to talk about God or however you wanted to phrase it. Tell us a little bit about your journey, maybe even like just starting out your, your growing up experience with a religion and then into like how social media started. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So definitely consider myself part of that first initial wave of social media, Christian air quotes, influencers. That's, that's like my least favorite term for <laughs> describing what I do. That was um, going to be a question I wanted to ask you. Like, do you oh, like yeah. that term? <laughs> no, I hate the hate the term influencer because it comes with so much baggage, right? Right. Uh, but are I mean, you taking it, like, do you tend to uh, just this is for everybody's own knowledge? Like, I mean, how much skin are you showing usually in your in your photos? Like, how much <laughs> how much do you choose? Oh man, Especially well, nothing nothing past the ankles. So, somewhat <laughs> ironically, ever since I moved to Hawaii, that has been part of the content. Not in that way, but you know, I wear a tank top <laughs> every day when I'm out here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. just because it's the island and it's just it's a comfortable way of doing life. Uh, I, I remember what, that's, meeting that's someone. That's the excuse. That's yeah, the excuse that's, for at it, least yeah. that's the excuse, right? <laughs> now, uh, it, it's funny because I I ended up meeting someone in person at pastors' conference uh, mm. in Kentucky last year. Some of you guys probably were even there. And uh, this person has been a student of the Digital Missionary Academy, which I guess we'll probably end up talking at some point down the line. But this person has journeyed with me digitally for, for quite some time. And I showed up mm. at a pastor's conference. So, of course, I'm not going to wear board shorts and a tank top to this pastor's <laughs> convention. Right. And uh, her first comment to me, this pastor, was, oh, you have sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I guess nice. that's part of my trademark now. Uh, so, it's part of your yeah. brand. Yeah, the nice. brand, I guess it's not a bad brand to have uh, out here in Hawaii. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I consider myself part of that first generation. It's to the point where I use phrases every once in a while. Where back in my day, when I first started <laughs> on social, it's, it's one of those types of things. Uh, my kind of peers in the social media ministry world, I want to say the vast majority of them are not doing it anymore. Or flip side, mm. have found wild success because there's mm. just something mm. to the sticking power uh, and resiliency of choosing not to give up, and what happens when you do that for a decade, kind of a thing. Uh, I, I started doing online ministry really as an overflow of my in-person ministry. So mm. I actually started as a literature evangelist. Did this for ten years. I don't know if any of you guys subjected yourself to this type of experience. Um, I know that there are very measured and nuanced uh, reflections on these kinds of experiences. Uh, and I have my mixture of both the good, the ugly, and the bad, or I guess all three. Um, and I did it for 10 years, knocking on over 100,000 doors wow. towards the end of that experience, ended up teaching at a Bible college in Philadelphia, where I was hmm. leading kind of the, the evangelism uh, side of the curriculum. And hmm. when I got there, I met a young man by the name of Michael Troinoski III. And the reason why his story is so profound to me is because it was the first time that I actually had to think about social media uh, critically. I remember hmm. back in the day, I don't know if any of you guys were there, but there was a, a seminar by a guy who I won't name because some people will still recognize the name, but the seminar was called My Space Disgrace. Did that ever come across your feeds? No. Ooh, that sounds I want familiar. To, I want to hear that. I want to see that. <laughs> I think it's already I've, dating. Ju Justin, dating you got to name, you got to name names. Come on. I got, you know, <laughs> no, that, no, I'm just kidding. That, but, does, uh, that does sound no, familiar. Fine. Uh, oh so the conclusion space. of the seminar was that social media is evil, it's wicked, it's this terribly addictive thing, and it's rotting the spiritual lives of young people all over the world. Sure. And amen. Actually, amen. true. Like, all Praise of it, yes, the Lord. Hardy, amen. <laughs> <laughs> the result of the seminar was I went home and I deleted all my social media accounts. Wow. And, uh, deleted everything that I possibly had. And then years, years, years later, uh, ended up running into Michael. And Michael's story challenged that whole narrative because Michael became a Christian. Michael became a Seventh-day Adventist hmm. because of a YouTube video. 
not mm, anyone that had a platform. Okay. This guy probably had less than a thousand followers. If that he was filming videos on his phone, most likely not associated mm -hmm. with any kind of ministry, just a young person, literally thousands of miles away. The guy, uh, Michael was living in Philadelphia at the time. And this other person was in the Northwest. And for whatever reason, Michael found this absolutely compelling, decided to give his life to Jesus, became a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, wow. was studying at the school to enter into full-time ministry as a consequence of the evils of the social media. I don't and, know. Uh, I, don't, I feel conflicted about saying amen. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm saying amen to. <laughs> so from there, I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay, hold on. So what matters is not the mechanism by which we share the message. What matters is the message itself. And mm. I guess it doesn't matter if the message is preached from behind a pulpit, uh, if it's passed out in a glow tract, if it's heard on the radio or television, or apparently in the case of Michael, even through social media. And so through his mm. story, I'm like, all right, I'm going to give this thing a shot. I made, it was around New Year's when I started to kind of, kind of land on this conclusion. I said, you know, I'm going to give this thing one year's kind of runway. Uh, I started my YouTube channel at the time and committed to making one video every single week and just see what would happen. Hmm. And I had all the disadvantages of never uh, taking a single marketing class or uh, graphic design class, uh, never really learning how to operate a camera. Heck, I wasn't even part, you guys remember this, but I wasn't even part of the yearbook team. <laughs> uh, the one team in my Adventist Academy that would have had some kind of exposure to the creative worlds. Uh, yeah. I, I generally tell this in, from the perspective, like you see those those images on social media where there's like the left brain and the right brain, and one of them's like really cool and colorful and expressive and very exciting, and it's like that's the mm -hmm. one that everyone wants to be. And then there's the boring one. I was absolutely the boring one. My favorite <laughs> class in high school was math. Like I actually oh, enjoyed gosh. doing math for fun. My dad would literally sometimes like in the winter as we're uh, putting our uh, setting our Christmas tree on fire in the fireplace. He would scrawl out uh, with a Sharpie on newspapers, math problems, and I would do them for fun. Like that's how nerdy <laughs> I was. We're Justin, not the same we, person, Justin. Can we pause on <laughs> burning our Christmas tree in the fireplace? That wasn't a tradition that my family had. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just wondering. <laughs> just imagining shoving the Christmas tree slowly Well, it wasn't, wasn't all at once. On it, it was generally a couple hour experience because obviously <laughs> the flames are quite, quite big. But it, right. I don't know. It was just a fun way to kind of wind things down. That's cool. Um, and so I, was, I wasn't predisposed for social media, but mm -hmm. really was enamored with the idea of, man, I put all this time and energy to preaching to a church. It was a church plant at the time, let's say 50 people at most. Or if I was lucky, I'd get invited to speak at a conference or a guest church for 100 or 200 people or whatever the case is. Um, my motivation be behind being a literature evangelist is that I could literally not think of a more effective way to communicate in the gospel to as two large numbers of people. I could go the traditional route and go the pastoral route, but all things being equal, I don't think that I'm lucky enough or fortunate enough or maybe even talented enough to be the pastor of a university church, much less, much less like a, a, a mega church and speak to thousands of people. So the idea of speaking to two or 300 people every single day people who weren't members of my community of faith, like that to me was like, that's the logical progression. If the gospel has changed my life and I want people to experience that, it just makes sense that that's the best way to use my life. So I did it for 10 years. It was just the natural consequence of this belief. And then I realized if I could learn how to contextualize the same questions that the young people were asking me as I was doing discipleship, if I could learn how to contextualize the same messages that I would be preaching every Sabbath, uh, uh, in churches around the country, like, it would just make sense that I could potentially reach dozens, hundreds, maybe even more with the same message. Hmm. So I really leaned into it. And about 10 months into this journey, really felt that God uh, was nudging me in the direction of going all in on social media ministry. Now for context, I think I had like 300 subscribers on YouTube. There was no good reason why mm -hmm. I should believe that this would be the case <laughs> other than just uh, pure stupidity or faith, whichever one it's probably a combination of the two, but I sense a call in my life. pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they kind of overlap. In yeah. Some ways. So true. Um, came home from work that day, told my wife, Emily, uh, I think God has made it clear. We've been having the conversation in the background for, for a while, but God finally made it clear. It's time for me to go all in on social media ministry. Kind of the impact of that is I'm going to quit my job 
you, although we've just been married for like a year, you're going to be our full-time breadwinner and I'm going to make videos on the internet for the 300 <laughs> followers that I have. Wow. Average views of like 30 views per video. Like it was just stupid, right? Yeah. Has she divorced you yet? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this is the crazy thing, man. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Uh, she <laughs> took like one long uh, kind of belabored breath mm -hmm. and was like, all right, let's do wow. it. So 30 days later, uh, mm. I, uh, ended up resigning my position and we moved across the country into the kind of spare bedroom in her family's, uh, house where oh, she grew up nice. and the rest is in fact history. Wow. And so that's kind of the origin of it all. And, uh, you know, it's been now, I don't know, eight years, we're closer to a decade now than yeah. five years. So it's kind of crazy to think that so much has happened. And obviously things have changed over the years. There's new platforms, there's new algorithms, there's just new strategies, but the heart of it remains the same is the desire for people to encounter the gospel, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to encounter the Holy Spirit in their lives and to in some way, shape or form pass along what I've, I've received. Yeah, wow. this, this is a quick aside, Justin, just really quick. So we could we could dig into this, but you mentioned really quick the idea that early on with MySpace, you know, I remember we were all there, right? The MySpace oh, era, classic. the early YouTube, the early YouTube era. Good times. Um, Sean like was in my top friends. The, oh, man, <laughs> nice. the birth, the birth of the not. Internet, you know, like all the, the, the first the first memes, you know, remember when you're like, wait, these are the best. I need to find more of these and anti jokes and yeah, all the um, nonsense on anti -joke the Internet. Joke chicken uh, was our favorite. Yep. One. Uh, and the Velociraptor, all the, yeah. uh, all the early <laughs> mid two thousands yeah. nonsense on the internet. Oh, but that was, so that was a good time. That was a good time. But really quick, you mentioned that in the church, there was this perception that social media, even the internet was kind of this very reserved, like, Oh, we need to stay private. You shouldn't go on there. Especially our youth mm -hmm. shouldn't go on there. We mm -hmm. shouldn't go and get connected, especially, you know, even this idea of like, don't spend too much time on screens and all that stuff as well. That's all wrapped in together. That was the perception. Then it's become more accepted now to have social media and all those things. Even still, some hesitancy with with younger kids, and it depends on what age. But what would you say, like today, is that same? Is, is there an equivalent in our church that you'd say today that we are fighting back against? That you'd actually say, "Oh, this has a lot of potential. This would this this could be used for a lot of good." This tool. Is there anything like that today compared to back then that yeah. you think would be equivalent? That's a good question because we, we can kind of take it for granted now on the other side of COVID. Um, now there's a, a much greater acceptance, but there's still definitely two major categories, at least in my experience within the church. The category of people that see it as a necessary evil. That, yeah. Okay, fine. I have to, but I really don't want to. And, you know, unless I'm forced to, I will not do it. And then there's the other camp that's like really catching on with the vision, whereas previously... I mean, it, it's no exaggeration to say that somewhere in my experience, upwards of 90% of people were actively hostile sure. to the notion yeah. of social media ministry. Yeah. It, it was like saying, I'm going to start a Ouija board ministry. It, it <laughs> felt that kind of, that kind of <laughs> right. effect. The yeah. most positive kind of response that I would get from, from people that I would kind of share my stories with or pitch the vision towards, it was a gentle pat on the shoulder, like go get them tiger kind of a feeling <laughs> where it's like, Mm. I really hope that this doesn't take off. I don't really want it to work, but I'm yeah. going to be a, a, a charitable Christian kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. On this side of COVID now, though, I think that people have really started to, to catch vision. And the conversation has shifted in many ways from should we to how do we, which is a yeah. much yeah. better and healthier conversation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so for those who are unconvinced, and I generally get this question in my coaching calls, like how do I convince my church board or how do I convince my leaders? And my answer more or less is like, hey, if COVID couldn't, can, uh, couldn't change their mind, then nothing will. Yeah. So it's not mm. worth spending that type of time because the people who get it, get it. And there's enough people who do get it that we can actually spend meaningful time around the mm. how mm -hmm. question, not the mm. should we or why should I kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's that's a major part of my, my life right now. In addition to me just doing online ministry for myself, um, when I first pitched the vision of what social media ministry would look like to my wife in these early conversations, we had a handful of kind of hopeful outcomes. I said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to make any money uh, for years. I think if I will ever be able to bring in an income, it's at least five years down the line. And so the conversation Ooh. around going all in on social media ministry had this subtext of you're paying the bills for five years, more or less. Mm. And that ended up being nearly exactly true. My, wow. uh, wow. the first like real profitable year was like year four, 
perhaps. Mm. Everything was done at a massive sacrifice. Uh, my first mm. year of full-time YouTube ministry, I earned like 20 grand, but I had to spend 18 grand in acquiring equipment <laughs> yeah. and getting education Ooh. and right. traveling and getting coaching and all the things. So all intents and purposes, whatever little we could earn for you know full-time equivalent work was poured right back into the ministry. And it wasn't until year number five that things started to actually become somewhat sustainable as a ministry. Not only that, but we had the vision of uh, the five-year plan. Do you guys know about the five? Have you heard about the five-year plan before? This idea that you, know, you get married and then you don't have kids for oh, five right. years. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Five years later, we ended up having a child. And the vision was not only would the ministry reach some level of sustainability, but it would provide a space for my wife to choose, if she wanted to, to dedicate all our attention to being mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're now two years uh, past having a child and she's still uh, getting to exercise that choice. And we're really, really, really grateful That's for awesome. it. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. it's a beautiful gift. And it just, all of it is a, a, a complete testimony to my wife's vision and faithfulness because literally none of it's possible if she doesn't catch on. If she yeah. in that conversation says, I don't know, that doesn't sound very exciting, then mm. I'd still be working my normal job. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so could, all shout outs and credits to, to her. For sure. And could you tell us like, what are some of the things that um, you are engaged in, in the context of, of, of the ministry side of things. Not that, not that coaching isn't ministry or anything like that, but let's sure. just say like the, your specific personal, cause I know for instance, like you guys have like a discord pretty much church, right? Or something close to internet that church. Yeah. And, we have a thing called internet church. We don't have a discord yet. We're mm -hmm. in the process of building out our server and everything mm -hmm. else like that. To be honest, I'm still learning. The only time I use discord and this is maybe, maybe this is the part of the show that gets censored of anything because the only time <laughs> nah. I use discord is hanging out with some of you guys playing yeah. video games. <laughs> Wait, we don't do that. What are you talking about? <laughs> so discord has only been voice I calls for do. me, but yeah. apparently it's much more profound than that. So we're, we're working on discord, but um, long story short, I, I make lots of social media stuff mm -hmm. all for the purpose of beginning conversations and helping people to hopefully have aha moments when it comes to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And then as the next step from all the social medias, whether that's podcasting, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, fill in the blank, uh, the invitation is to join a Bible study group. Mm -hmm. And every single month we're having hundreds of people signing up for Bible studies, which when you Dang. compare when I compare at least to the literature evangelism dream of knocking on two or 300 doors, yeah. maybe getting two people to sign up for Bible studies. And as a Bible right. worker, you have 10 Bible study contacts and one of them shows up to their appointment kind of a thing. Like yeah. the, 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 uh, the, the, the rate at which people fall off and flake is astounding. Mm -hmm. to then I, just, think I now, do just want to point out that literature evangelism is probably the holiest form of evangelism <laughs> that right. you can do. I just want to make <laughs> that right. very clear. That's Especially what you're doing. Even, what Man, you're doing is mixing the world yet. with evangelism, and because of that, it's like it's like it's diluted. It's, yeah, Especially it's diluted. if you're vegan, brother. Oh man, <laughs> you should have been vegan, or you would have seen more fruit. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Shut, Actual shut fruit, because that's all you can eat. Uh, <laughs> just, okay, uh, uh, no, no, actually, just, have a, sorry. Sorry, oh, sorry if, yeah. if I could just, could, I just want to follow up on what you say. Like, what, so you you have like this these Bible studies that you're running. Mm -hmm. Um, and then sort of that internet church, so is that, is that kind of what that is or is the internet church side of things a little bit separate or it's, it's the, the internet church I, in my mind is probably like the third step in the, the journey of a person. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. first step is social media, finding people from, as strangers. And then the second step is inviting them into a small group. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the ministry that I'm a part of, we have something like, I don't know, 10, live Bible studies that happen throughout different time zones nice, and yeah. people can sign up for any, any different one that they want. I happen to run just one of them on Sunday mm -hmm. mornings. Uh, and so, you know, my last Bible study had a hundred people literally nice, show up yeah. live. Dang, yeah, um, wow. And then the third so step cool. of the, the funnel, if you will, would be uh, an actual live internet church gathering that we do mm -hmm. over zoom right now. Uh, and that's kind of one of the deeper levels of engagement. Then we have the mm -hmm. Facebook community, which will soon become discord and a whole host of discipleship content. We have hundreds of pieces of discipleship material available. So Dang. there's there's very much a, a sense in which if someone signs up for the ecosystem, that they have hundreds of hours worth of discipleship as well as live community digitally. Mm -hmm. um, and right now we're starting to explore what does it look like to do pop-up events? What does mm -hmm. it look like to do live gatherings? We had a gathering in North Carolina, 50 people showed up and five people got baptized. Dang, uh, awesome. I just saw someone literally this last Sabbath who moved to Hawaii and ended up joining us in our local church as a consequence of the the, wow. the way that we've stewarded these relationships. And wow. she's not the first one. Yeah, and so cool. we're seeing this movement towards 
digital towards IRL, and it's very exciting mm. to see all of that. So, like you, you are. We could joke. And, You're a pastor. And, yeah, we could joke all we want about like the social media influencer stuff like that, um, and attracting people with your your uh, ripped shoulders. But uh, <laughs> the, but but really, in real in 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 your your hope for people, it's to go from that social media is the beginning of engagement. It's a, it's an absolute like great step. It's it, it in and of itself it is good, but it hopefully is serving to feed people into a space where they can grow, find community. Like pretty much be in church. I would offer a little bit of a nuance on that. It's not mm -hmm. my hope that they show up in, in per like it's not the goal that they show up in person. Mm -hmm. It's a hope that they do. Yeah. But the goal more so is that they get exposed to the gospel. Yeah, yeah. And whether that's in person with us or that's yeah. on literally the other side of the world, sometimes my Bible mm -hmm. studies are quite international. People in Argentina and South Korea and mm -hmm. in Ecuador and in Egypt, all in the same room, right? That's awesome, yeah. I'm very, very... Uh, at peace with the notion that 99% of the people that I interact with, I will never meet in person. Mm -hmm. I'm at mm -hmm. peace with that because at the end of the day, I don't see it as anything different than what Paul did as he's launching churches and writing letters. I don't see it any right. differently yeah. than John on the island of Patmos writing uh, follow-up letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. I, mm -hmm. I see it in the same context that what really matters is that the spirit is at work in their life. Now, the, if, the different context is that you don't get beat up in person. You get beat up in yeah. the comments. That's <laughs> right. That's there's, the there's a, there's a the difference there for sure. For sure, for sure. <laughs> so if I can just introduce them to the gospel, I'm, I consider that, that the ultimate win. And then what the spirit chooses to do with that is entirely the spirit's prerogative. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Justin, Anthony, you had, some, you had something to say, and then I wanted to segue from from what Jesse said yeah. about the comments to our our main thing. Yeah, for sure. And and uh, I, mean, I mean, just to kind of... I bridge the gap a little bit, Justin. We wanted you on because you know we've been talking to different prolific Adventists about what it means to be an Adventist. Is that, is that what I am? That's yeah, what you're prolific. You are, bro. You're prolific. Have mercy. Um, Contextually, I don't know what Anthony means, but we're just going to go with it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's just go with it. Um, but I mean, I do say that with sincerity, um, and I think, I guess, before we kind of bridge into that, I I'm curious about kind of. Um, I mean, you clearly have a heart for evangelism. You have a heart for the gospel. Um, you were out there grinding, doing literature evangelism for 10 years. Like, that's hard work. We're all summer camp boys, so that's what we did in the summer. Oh, you guys took uh, the easy route out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you've felt, if not explicitly heard, how literature evangelists view camp, uh, camp ministry. No, yeah. I never actually no, heard actually, it explicitely. No. Uh, well, I know how that. summer camp people view literature evangelis evangelists. Oh, do, do tell me. Do tell me. Well, I always felt like there was this weird like rivalry going on where like the summer camp people were just like, why would you ever do literature evangelism? <laughs> <laughs> I never, ever felt this. Yeah, I just I, felt like if you were doing literature evangelism, that you had a completely different view of the world than I did. <laughs> That's no, probably I, I, true. I resonated That's with that. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that from... Uh, a lot of the literature evangelists that I met, they would view uh, camp ministry like soy milk. Oh, it's like interesting. It's, it's not like, really this is, the same thing. It's like like the you just pool. wanted to have fun all summer. You didn't want to do ministry. Now, of oh. course, this is not true. My wife's a camp kid. Uh, she did camp. And obviously, my, I've had to grow and evolve in this. But at the time, I very much looked at camp ministry as a, as a kind of a convenient cop out from doing the real front lines. Oh, day. that's so great. Yeah. Wow. I love that. <laughs> I, I, That's all of this I, I brought up to say, um, you know, you you clearly have a heart for evangelism and the gospel. You were doing it for such a long time, even before you transitioned to social media. And I'm curious about kind of like your personal why, your personal heart. Um, you know, you you talk about how the gospel changed your life. I guess I'm curious mm -hmm. if you tell us a little bit about that story. Were you, you grew up Adventist. What's sort of your, your history there and yeah. some sort of the moment where it became personal and real to you? Yeah. Well, I mean... Geez, how, how long do we have? I guess um, 30 grew up seconds. In Adventist, 30 seconds. All right. I grew up in an Adventist family, K through 12, went to the same school, Glendale Adventist Academy, shout outs. Oh, you're um, from down but, here. Okay. No, I'm, I'm right. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's neighbors. I'm I'm teaching at San Gabriel, so I'm I'm a neighbor. Oh, we're rivals. Oh. Yeah, there were rivals. I, I'm saying neighbor. I'm I'll, trying to be nice here. Right? Well, I just will hap happen to uh, point out that when I was on the the volleyball team, we did in fact beat San Gabriel. Uh, so just let's not talk about the... let's not talk about basketball though. Let's, let's 
we're not rival. It's not a rivalry. Way better at basketball. It's not a rivalry if there's nothing happening on the other <laughs> side of the court. Sean. Sean's like, we're not rivals here. Let me verbally crush you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, very much so- SoCal kid, um, K through twelve, did the whole thing. But but Adventism and Christianity, more importantly, was very much so uh, just part of the noise of my life. Yeah. It was in the backdrop, and it didn't yeah. really take any kind of uh, prominence in my life. Um, that would change my first summer canvassing. 17 years old, just graduated high school, ended up doing my first summer canvassing. Long story short, it changed so much. It, mm. I felt like I finally had a purpose and a sense of direction with my life, where up to that point, I would say I was very much so wandering and uh, having experiences with depression and mm. just kind of this existential crisis of what am I going to do and all the things. And, and canvassing and ministry provided clarity. Um, mm. and, and purpose and something that was really meaningful. And so that was maybe the first iteration. That's when I made the decision to, to really give my heart to the Lord and to be rebaptized. I got baptized as a kid, as everyone else does. There's a funny story around that. I don't know if we have time for that, but I, I, yeah. Um, Circle ended back. up getting rebaptized as, as in high school or at the end of my high school experience. And that was a launch of my ministry. Uh, and that was fantastic. I, I went through a lot of really good stuff there, really grateful for the experience, uh, a lot of learning that took place. But I would say where I really got to get a, a sense of clarity on the gospel wasn't until way later, mm -hmm. uh, maybe 10 years later. Uh, up to that point, it was very much a commitment to living life in the best way that I knew how to serve the Lord. And that was very earnest and, and a uh, sincere decision. But wouldn't really say that I had clarity on the gospel. I had, mm -hmm. I had a very clear sense on the way I should be living my life and the way that I should tell other people how they should be living their life and kind of all the, the right ways to do it kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, but the gospel really took root maybe around, it was 2018 or so. Mm. And really, uh, that's recent. Wow. Yeah, I, it was recent. And I'll just say, man, Relatively. like in the same way that like the before Jesus to after Jesus moment is so different, mm -hmm. the before gospel and after gospel is more oh, yeah. profoundly uh, well, different for me yeah, as well. Absolutely. And so um, you may have noticed if you follow along the social medias that there's a shift from the kind of content that I was creating pre pre experience of the gospel, very much like a, what should you do or how to's and very much like good advice content yeah. rather than good gospel content. Mm -hmm. And so experiencing the gospel for myself, man, it just gave me that extra layer of clarity as to what specifically do I want to do? Not just ministry in general, yeah. uh, not just content in general, but really what is the thing that I want to be highlighting the most? And yeah, turns out that's the gospel. Yeah. Dang, man. I, I actually awesome. want to swing back to that a little bit later when we get into the meat of our... Sure thing. Our I think it'll go well, like right in the middle. And I'll, I'll maybe try to remember to explain why. But I, I did want to ask, so Jesse mentioned how you, um, we could look at the YouTube comments, right? Like we could see bashing or whatever or on social media. I, I, a standout thing, Justin, is I've watched your reels throughout um, the past few months or even the last year is looking at, you did one reel on Sabbath and sex. And uh, <laughs> sure. I found it was a great, it was one. a great reel. Not well, just no, it was a, I got Justin that from Anthony done. though, actually. There was yeah. a whole conversation <laughs> so in the true. background with Anthony. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, because and, it was, what, and that was because of our meme, wasn't it? Like, I think it was. was you guys meme? posted a meme, and I'm like, oh man, we you were, guys went there. We were thinking of it, and I think Anthony mentioned it to you, and then we created the meme, and then you came out with that post. Yes. Oh, so, so we that was after that was a reaction. I had yeah. no idea that any of this was know, connected, but for yeah. sure, I was having the chat, the conversation with Anthony over League Chat, yeah. and yeah, we're yeah. talking about these themes, and I'm like, should mm -hmm. I make this? And he's like, yeah, you should make it. I'm like, all right, 100%. cool, I'm gonna go for it. <laughs> oh, so and, this was in response to the Anchorman reel. Yeah. It, well, no, no, no. So t for context, we make memes now on our on our uh, Instagram just for, page, which for pure giggles, just purely because that is, yeah. Anyways, so Sean decided to make one off of the Anchorman, the Anchorman song, uh, afternoon, afternoon delight. delight. Yeah. And yeah. then it's like you know what your parents did on Sabbath afternoon, you know, and stuff like that. So like <laughs> it's. That was the context when we were thinking about that. And I think, uh -huh. Anthony, before we ever posted it, you had that conversation with Justin. And then, Justin, mm -hmm. you actually posted like a theological idea behind it. Ours is just a meme. <laughs> Yours is actually like, hey, here's this a meaningful. Like well Yours is meaningful. And, like, <laughs> deeply thought out. Ours is a waste of time and space. <laughs> <laughs> you need both. It's the right brain, left brain thing that you're yeah, talking exactly. about. Yeah, yeah. That's, no, that's exactly. That's so funny. <laughs> But oh, anyways, man. Sean, were you going to bring so, something? Oh, okay. well, either way, but but I remember going through that because it was a great, it was a great reel. It had a lot of meaning behind, you know, Sabbath and everything. But it, it, 
it's amazing how like you go in the comments, right? And there's just these mm. debates over things. And, and one of the things that stood out to me, Justin, was that one person's like, wait, they had this realization. Justin, are you an Adventist? Like, don't tell me this guy's <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist. Because oh, no. for a long time, I think, mm. because even going back as far to your YouTube channel, which was called That Christian Vlogger, you know, yeah. maybe it didn't mm -hmm. have, and it's not like you were trying to hide your Adventist identity, at least that's not what the impression I got uh, from what you were doing even back then to what you're doing now through your YouTube channel, through Instagram, everything else. But I think a lot of people that did follow you weren't necessarily Adventist. And then they saw that, or they saw maybe certain pieces of your content. They were like, wait a second, this guy believes in Ellen White. And then you see, and then, and then it didn't even have anything to do with the content of your mm -hmm. uh, video. They just get into these long debates and discussions. You can go back on your Instagram and see these. And it, it just kind of made me laugh because I see the same thing happening to us a bit too with these nonsense reels we're putting out. People are having legitimate discussions like over theological theology <laughs> and, and all this stuff, but which, which seems to be just an Adventist reality. Like we all no, have it's to not just we have to, it's we other have to, Christians. It's I other know. Christians I, well, it's, I get yeah. that. I get that. Yeah. But it happens too with an Adventism. Like it, we intellectualize and have to make everything serious. But anyways, I don't even think, I don't even think most of our Adventist people like that, that you're thinking of Sean, or even on Instagram, I think most of our boomer <laughs> parents are still stuck on Facebook having political arguments. Yeah, but there's still but, some, there, there's some that are like, anyways, we could, we could talk about that later. But, but the reason I bring that up, Justin, is, um, when, when we get into, you know, you are a seventh day Adventist and, um, your reach has be, been beyond, you know, well beyond the Adventist church. Um, but of course that's, that's something that you subscribe to. You're an Adventist. Um, and it, yeah, it's interesting to see people realize that maybe a lot later than, you know, they, they could if they just saw. But you've, you've also, part of the reason, and, and I'll take slight credit for this, is part of the reason we wanted to have you on to all, do Sean. this Avenue series is I thought, it, it is all me, Anthony. Uh, <laughs> no, but I actually did think about, because we already, we've been talking about actually for years having you on to talk about a bunch of different things that we could. But I, I thought of the idea, oh, we should actually have Justin on because you have maybe not on purpose or maybe, so I'm not sure, but you have been in the spotlight within Adventism uh, kind of representing the church. And I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but yeah, you, to a lot of you have been a part of different discussions and debates over the past few years. Um, and, like and I guess instance, we'll get a, into a video, it. Yeah. a video where you're like talking with another guy um, about Adventism and cause he had some, some questions and some issues with it. And then you're answering his questions and you guys end up like, right. I, think, I think meeting in person, or maybe that's a different video. You guys like meet in person and talk more mm -hmm. about it and stuff. So mm -hmm. like, yeah. it's sort of like there's somebody out there in, in the, in the Christian, in the greater Christian space who is yeah. representing yeah. Adventism. Yeah. yeah. And, and I want to ask you about those experiences, but before we do, I, I, we'll get to that, but I want to ask you first though, just the fundamental question, right? We're doing this whole series. That's qu the question is what is an Adventist? So just your pitch, like if you're sharing that, um, with others, you know, what's your answer to that question? Like what, what is an Adventist? How do you answer that? Yeah. So I think the challenge with trying to answer this question is the reality that is Adventism is not a monolith. Like there is no such thing as one Adventism. Uh, and just literally any exposure to travel will demonstrate this fact, especially if you're in Loma Linda, man. There's like 50 churches within a <laughs> stone's throw. And sure. depending on which one has the best potluck, you would experience a different kind of Adventism. <laughs> yeah. um, and and it's just that's just the way that it is. And I think it's actually one of the greatest strengths of Adventism. That uh, There was a, a study that highlighted that the, the most diverse denomination in the United States is Adventism. And that's true mm. from, from a kind of... Uh, socioeconomic perspective. That's true from a cultural perspective. That's true from a, a political perspective. Like we are just a diverse group of people. And mm. part of the fruit of that is that Adventism is experienced in many different ways. I had a friend of mine who used to do uh, communication for the division. And he said, you know, if there are if there are X million Adventists and there are X million versions of Adventism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's, that's profound that, that there is no such thing as one Adventism. So, so for me though, the thing that I identify with most and the thing that I'm excited about most about Adventism is what I understand, like the, the spirit of Adventism is really the spirit of the Bereans. Mm. Um, we can look at 28, yeah. this and that, or Love 27, that. depending on the timeline, if you want to, yeah. and that's great and all. And there's a lot that we could say about that, but, prior to the 28 things or the 27 things is this important sentiment that Seventh-day Adventists accept the Bible as their only creed and that's it. 
Mm -hmm. And so for me, Adventism at its heart is the spirit of the Bereans. We are a people who are committed to studying the word and choosing to follow wherever it goes. So much to the extent that we would be willing to push against the cultural trend. We'd be willing to say we were wrong about this and move in a more holistic uh, kind of direction. Mm. And to me, that is deeply attractive. Mm -hmm. That uh, there's a certain sense of humility to say we Mm. still have things to learn. There are Would things you, that we believe, good. and this is the best articulation. These are the 28 best articulations of what we believe scripture teaches, but we're not even going to hold ourselves to these 28 things because we want to create space and a certain level of humility to say that the spirit of God might want to still reveal things to us. Mm-hmm. To me, if that's not Adventism, then I don't want a part of it. But mm. if that mm. is, and I, I happen to hold that, that is Adventism, then to me, Adventism is perhaps the most attractive package as it were, yeah. because we can hold strongly, strong beliefs about certain views of God and the world and all these things, which are, or, which are fantastic, but we could do so with a level of uh, humility that just, I think that very few other um, packages have to offer. Mm. Could I just, real quick for, for people who might not know what the Berean reference is. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. Want to just explain that real quick? Yeah, there, there's a, a section in the New Testament where it talks about the, the, the church at Berea, is I think is where they were first called Christians because they would search the scriptures daily and see if these things were so. Yeah. So see, uh, the way that I've understood the reference is that Bereans are the kinds of people that don't take anything at face value. They'll, they're willing to hear you, but then they go back to the word and, and, and really just try and get to the bottom of it all. Mm-hmm. To me, that's what I want Adventism, be, Adventism to be. That's the Adventism that I claim. And that's the Adventism that I, I seek to, to make known to the world is that we are a people of the book. And we're willing to push back against cultural trends and traditions and everything else that seems to go out of line with the book itself. It's interesting because I I fully agree with you <clears throat> in that. What and, and it is one of the more clear things that Adventists will maybe boast about, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but just like that is our thing. We go back to the Bible. Well, one of the fruits of that thing is that going back to the Bible has traditionally sort of meant going to Daniel revelation and the law (laughs) and some like the proof text across, across like, you know, the state of the dead or the idea of what happens after you die. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's like what it, what it, what it means when we say people of the book is uh, of course, different to a lot of different communities. Mm -hmm. But I think there's maybe a continuity of experience amongst at least the three of us who are here, um, I don't know if it was the same for you, but also just I, because I am here at Loma Linda and we get so many people who are coming from other Adventist spaces to this space and hearing their stories, the continuity of the idea, I kind of just picked up that studying the Bible was about studying these distinctive Adventist beliefs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and prophecy. And so when we talk about, and I think this is probably what you were going to go back into, Sean, with with talking about the gospel is that like, one of the questions I wanted to sort of jokingly ask is like, oh, you found the gospel in Adventism? <laughs> like, that's sort of a surprise. I mean, it, it's if, I mean, I think Anthony, and I could say the same thing and probably you too, Sean, like with where we sort of met the gospel, it was a fluke. It was a, mm, a guy from yeah. Hawaii. So, there, you know, there's something mm. about Hawaii, Justin. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy from <laughs> Hawaii out. who was like our dean at, at Auburn Academy, and he just happened to really be into the 1888 message, which was righteousness by faith. And, uh, like he happened to be so into that that he couldn't help but say it. He couldn't shut up about it. And that's mm-hmm. how we were exposed to it. It wasn't anybody like in the traditional system that really brought the gospel into our understanding. So I don't know, is that, a, is, is that an experience for you or have you seen that with other people that, that that's sort of the idea of being people of the book? And if that's not what it truly should be, what is your heart behind people of the book or like yeah. people that study like the Bereans? It, it, unfortunately, I would say that that's definitely been true for me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, surprised by the gospel, uh, if not even outrightly offended by the gospel in 2018 was kind of more the tone. Yeah. Um, I had a construct of what I believed the scriptures to teach. And you, I think that you're, you're right on point there that what I was spending all my time s- discovering in the scriptures were the things that we had already held. The, the mm-hmm. 28 this, the Daniel and Revelation that I, I've preached my fair share of those exact seminars as an evangelist myself. And so in 2018, when someone literally from a stage reads Romans chapter six to me and declares, not even declares, repeats the words that I'm free from sin, the whole thing was shook. And I was like 
I was in my own body, like hot and bothered and stressed and anxious and all the emotional experiences because I think at some core level, I knew that what was being read to me was somehow incompatible with the way that I was holding my version of Adventism together. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. And so it was a rude awakening. And, and, and um, for what it's worth, maybe this is a helpful insight to the way that I articulate what I, what I teach online, is that there's a lot of oomph in many of the posts in the hook and yeah. kind of the bold mm -hmm. de declarations that I'm sharing. It's because yeah. I know what it's like to be on the other side of that and and have to wrestle through it. And yeah. the mm. fruit of that having to wrestle through it as uncomfortable as it had made me feel was that I actually was able to embrace the gospel for the first time. Yeah. Mm. So I'm willing to be uh, the thorn in someone's side. I'm willing to be <laughs> the pebble in someone's shoe. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to be misunderstood and uh, kind of slandered by people who don't understand what I'm actually saying or misinterpret or intentionally misrepresent what I'm saying, I'm willing to do that in the hopes that people would come to understand the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that all stems from the, the literal experience that I had yeah. at like, what was it? I don't know. I was maybe 28 years old or something like that at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being surprised to say okay. the least with the gospel. Justin, can you circle back just briefly to th that incompatibility that you talked about, like the words that you're hearing, you're hearing someone read Romans, lit literally the words of Paul, Romans chapter six, and you're feeling this incompatibility. What do you think is the source of that? Where does that mm. tension come from? At least, or where did it come from for you? Sure, sure. When, when I understood the, uh, the, the good news previously, the good news was that I could overcome sin. This was the kind of major emphasis of my life. And righteousness by faith, the words were used many times, <clears throat> but the conclusion was if I had enough faith and practiced my faith well enough, then I could hopefully one day become righteous. Mm -hmm. And so what that often looked like localized in my own brain and, and I'll own whatever, maybe everyone in the church has been articulating it well and it's my ADD, ADHD, <laughs> that I'm just a terrible student, like all of it's true, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm willing to own my part of this and just say, maybe it was just me. I got it wrong the whole time. That's fine. But I understood um, that the focal point was on, was on what I do. If I pray enough, if I read my Bible enough, if I pass mm -hmm. out enough glow tracks, if mm -hmm. I'm vegan enough, <clears throat> if I'm disciplined <clears throat> enough, right? All the yeah. different things. So much to the extent that I went to La Sierra University my freshman year, I wore a button up shirt and a tie every day mm -hmm. to class in the attempt at dress reform. Like wow. I'm tipping my hand slightly. Some of you <laughs> guys who are listening That's understand what, what all the implications of this are. I was a vegan. I didn't drink water in my meals. Like I had two meals wow, a day. I knocked man. on a hundred thousand. Oh, this, this is probably yeah, for those who are in the know. hundred thousand doors. I right? feel like, like <laughs> you get what I'm laying down. I haven't yeah. heard the don't drink water during your meals. That's thing. an Ellen White. Oh, that's because that 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 you don't read Ellen White, Anthony. That's yeah, right. Actually, 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 read our prophetess. While I was passing out great controversies, you were over there. <laughs> There's the summer camp. There it is. It's I proof. see the bitterness is still there, <laughs> Justin, deep in your heart. <laughs> it's not a stereotype if it's true. <laughs> it's not. That's uh, right. That's right. To be right. honest, to be honest, Yikes. Anthony was teaching BMX, and BMX is the place where I would I expect the least theologically uh, <laughs> sound person to be. So you know what. And you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, you, also, yeah. uh, you also can't mix uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, That's exactly right. Too. And you got to eat really? your vegetables first. I'm Wait, because they digest man, faster. Know Otherwise, if you eat yep. vegetables after the heartier part of your meal, then they ferment in your stomach and leave and your cloudiness in your mind. Yep. Oh, I could so, talk. This, wait, hold on. So interesting. Anyways, wait, hold on. Just. I'm, oh, I'm genuinely curious. Have, has the conversation about tomatoes been had? Like if you have a tomato. Oh, I do know about that one. Because tomatoes are fruits and... Because they're... You can't mix fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Has that been a conversation of the conservative levels of... Pizza yes. is a conglomeration of the, sin. the kinds of questions <laughs> that my peers were asking. <laughs> the kinds of questions that my peers were asking were questions like, "Is it a sin for women to wear pants? Wow. Not even modest yeah. pants, but pants yeah. categorically, because a man should not wear what pertains to a woman, and a woman should not yeah. wear what mm. pertains to a man." Yeah. Uh, the conversations were, "Is it a sin to wear short sleeves?" Because Ellen White talks about the importance of your entire body having. Uh, covering so that way your circulation, yeah. which is the, the the key to health, being you know just a lot of really radical things. You must be really mm. struggling with your circulation right now because <laughs> you're literally. I in forgot a how we got right here. Now. Like we're talking about all these different things. What was the what was the train of thought that led us here? I, I think asked, we're just. Talk I yeah. did ask, what do you think is was that dissonance between your hearing of the oh, gospel yes. from Romans? <laughs> yes, and, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> the the emphasis in my experience in the message that I heard, which was called righteousness by faith, was if I do all these things, 
Mm -hmm. If I practice my faith, then one day I'll become righteous. And what that meant was, without them saying it, and no one would actually say, uh, no one would actually go out and say it, but this was the implicit message, was that if I am rigid enough in my faithfulness to all these things, then I will be able to overcome sin. Like there was an emphasis on living a life free from uh, participating in the kinds of things that you shouldn't participate in as a Christian. Mm -hmm. So victory over sin meant not actually experiencing any kind of shortcomings or falling anymore. So much to the extent that someone would even go as far to say that the thing that is, uh, that the thing that is holding back the second coming is an entire generation of people who actually are faithful enough to the extent that they are in fact righteous in the sense that they make no more mistakes. Mm -hmm that they don't sin anymore. And so I just, as I understood the gospel, the gospel was live the right way and eventually you could possibly become righteous. But even that proposition in my mind, as much as I was giving myself to it, it was still a coin flip at best at the end of my life. Would I actually oh, ever yeah. get there or not? I'm curious. I just wanted to, to ask, because I remember watching a, a GYC Generation Youth for Christ. It's sort of the more like traditional youth. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was there many years. Yeah. This guy, I think his name is Jason Sliger. He preached a sermon where he said, I'm not saying you need to be perfect. The Bible says you need to be perfect mm -hmm. in the context of like sort of that. No more sections. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and I don't, I wouldn't, I don't want to claim that he believes that, but the definite next step to that idea is that idea of perfectionism someday where you won't. And so, but then like what you're saying is that all of a sudden there's this idea that starts to hit you really hard, which is the wait, it's not that way. And so mm -hmm. like, how did that, how did that moment so, so conflict the, yeah. with your Adventism? So the, I mean, let me pull it up because it was literally just in the text itself, <laughs> Romans chapter six, literally, like if you just read it out loud and that's your perspective of the gospel and the whole point of this thing, it doesn't fit. Yeah. So Romans yeah. chapter six says, we know that our old self was crucified past tense with mm -hmm. him in order that the body of sin would be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for the one who has died again, past tense mm -hmm. has been set free from sin. It's over and over in that passage and many mm -hmm. other places in the book. But what was overwhelmingly clear to me in that moment from a clear reading of the text was that sin was something that we were free from. And in that localization of freedom from sin was not a future tense mm -hmm. thing but a past tense thing. Mm -hmm. And as I started to discover it a little bit more, specifically the localization of freedom was at the cross. Mm -hmm. And my participation in baptism was the the acceptance, my agreement that. with that reality. Yeah. So it was incompatible because righteousness by faith to me was be faithful enough, eventually you become righteous. Mm -hmm. And now I start to understand righteousness by faith in a different sense where, oh my goodness, my life doesn't always communicate this truth that I have enough reasons to doubt and I could point to my track record and all these things. But the text actually says that I am the righteousness of God mm -hmm. because of what Jesus has done. And as much as it's hard for me to believe that, righteousness by faith is actually to trust God's word and what yeah. he declares about me to be true against my experience mm -hmm. so and to do this so long and to be to, to build a life off this practice is the kind of life that actually results in the fruits yeah. of the spirit when you realize that you have the spirit you're not working to get the spirit and it's not that your veganism is the thing that is holding back the spirit of god yeah. but that you have it then the spirit is now free to work to in your life it. yeah if 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 what, it, if what I need to do to be righteous is to do certain things, then what I have is not righteousness. I have what's called self-righteousness, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Which is mm -hmm. to say no righteousness mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So yeah. little did I know that the version of the gospel that I had accepted up to this point was self-righteousness. It was salvation literally by works. And then to just literally hear those verses read out loud, I could immediately see the ways in which those two worlds were incompatible. And that's yeah. why I was frustrated because I had so, spent so much of my life built on this first model. And now all, I could see down the road, all of it would have to be undone if I was to yeah. receive this message. Dang, yeah. Man. So, so, what, so you'd say that when, when you encounter the gospel, you, you, you accept what Jesus has done. You have that belief, right? You have Romans six that results, like you said, in the fruits of the spirit that, that you'd mm -hmm. see results in your life. There'd be tangible. Is, is that fair, a fair line of logic that there'd be a visible, um, and Absolutely. spiritual transformation of your life so that the the works as we categorize them would be the fruits that come after the encounter of the gospel through the work of the Holy Spirit, not on our own works. Is that mm -hmm. the way that you'd, you'd interpret that process versus you said that it's the reverse 
the way you saw it before 2018, it's like the works that I was doing would enable me to experience this righteousness Correct. or experience pretty the, much the, the salvation the of Jesus. The previous is done without the spirit. It's, it's my own effort to be a certain way. And then well, hopefully I mean, I'm accepted on that side of it. On my former way of thinking, I, I would have maybe disagreed with you there. I would really? have said, no, it's the spirit that's at work in my life to help me to obey and to do all the right things okay. so yeah. that mm -hmm. I could be righteous. So yeah. I would have never I described it then as salvation by works, but yeah. I now know that's actually what it was. Gotcha. Yeah. I would have still said that I'm walking by faith, mm -hmm. yeah. but right. in practice, it wasn't that. What what Dang. makes it messy, right? If we and we can categorize liberal versus conservative here with an Adventism, the way that this th Romans six is perceived, and the way that you know whatever equation you want to look at the gospel, like how things happen in your life, the criticism from the conservative side is going to, of course, be that if if you live this idea free from sin, um, that oh, you see a lot of people that you don't see that really happening. Where oh, then how do we tangibly say like you're experiencing victory and transformation in your life. Like what are the things that are happening? I mm mean, -hmm. um, of course the, the, the more liberal side, again, I'm generalizing would say, you know, like what, what you've said in some ways, which is we can't make it based on specific tasks that we check off to guarantee that that means I'm, you know, dead to sin alive to God, you know, this, this right. idea I'm, I'm experiencing gospel transformation. So there's this, this back and forth, um, mm -hmm. where it feels like it just gets messy and murky, where mm -hmm. there's this mm -hmm. kind of back and forth, like you said, where we still have this in the church, where there's this, this fight back against your interpretation of Romans 6, mm -hmm. um, and of course, a fight back from the idea of perfectionism, um, sure. the idea that there are you know, specific tasks that I need to check off that will allow me to experience um, sanctification. You know, yeah. the, we're, we're in that, that's the whole thing too, that what is the process of sanctification? So sanctification sure. that's, that's be. just been a... You know, Sanctification for anybody who is confused means to be sorry. made holy, yeah. to be set apart. Yeah, I, this was very much the process for me of trying to figure out the, the kind of the consequences of this declaration in Romans. Um, for me, uh, let me just offer this. I know that this isn't the point of our conversation, but as you can tell, I can't help myself. Good stuff. With every yeah. social media post, I'm like, this is what I'm all about. So, what an evangelist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. The, the thing that helped me the most was realizing that my definition of sin was wrong. Therefore, my interpretation of freedom mm. from sin or victory over sin was wrong. Mm. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sin to me was doing bad things or not doing good things. Sin yeah. was localized mm. in my actions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. And okay. sin for me, the, I mean, this is the evangelist, the, the, the proof texting sin was transgression of the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Such that uh -huh. victory over sin had to mean that I would no longer transgress the law. Yeah. And therefore freedom from sin would mean similar, Keeping. similar things. I will Keeping not transgress the law, the law anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But this doesn't work because mm -hmm. it says that I was free past tense. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. already free, but I mess up all the time. Yeah. So mm -hmm. either the text is lying or I misunderstood the text all along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I came to the conclusion was I misunderstood the text. So mm -hmm. when I read Romans six to say, that I would no longer make mistakes, I'm actually doing it at the expense of the text itself. Mm. And it's the, the problem point, the pain point is a bad definition of sin. Yeah. And what I would learn is that there's a more inclusive and wholesome definition of sin, that sin isn't so much about not, not keeping the law perfectly or transgressing the law. It's not so much about what you do, though that's that's a consequence of it, mm, but that mm -hmm. sin is, is a larger thing. And Jesus would describe it this way. You've heard it said mm -hmm. that you shouldn't commit adultery or Do you shouldn't, you know, and mm -hmm. then Jesus actually, but I'm telling you, he's highlighting a more accurate it's, definition is, Hey, yeah. you look on a woman lustfully. So yeah. it's not about the fruit. Yeah. 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 It's about the root. What yeah. Jesus is describing is the problem is the root. Yeah. What Jesus uh -huh. is describing as the problem is the, is the heart. The heart and this yeah. is what first John three is communicating. It's lawlessness. It's there's yeah. an absence of righteousness in a person's life. There's a rebellion against the law that needs in, to be solved. In first so, John three, he defines it as sin is lawlessness. Correct. But you can, and, and, you can, you can say that, Oh, that must mean the law rule like, keeping. Of, the, of the old, old Testament, but really <laughs> what, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, well, I mean, uh, less accurate translations use First John three four to say that it's sin is the transgression of the law, but the yeah. but the original language actually says lawlessness, lawlessness and there's a difference yeah. between the two. Yep. And mm -hmm. so when I shifted my definition of sin from transgression of the law to lawlessness in keeping with the text, yeah, that's where things started to click. That the thing that I'm free from is that old stony heart, the heart mm -hmm. that says I am going to rebel, and when mm -hmm. God says go left, I want to go right, mm -hmm. and I like. I have a rebellion in my heart. What, what, what the gospel revealed to me is that if I see the cross and I say yes by faith, 
the consequence of that is that I receive a new heart, yeah. that God does a new thing in me, that the it's old good. passes away, yeah. I receive a new thing. And in this sense, I am free from the lawlessness of my former life. I'm free mm -hmm. from sin and I'm free to live righteously. I'm now no longer a slave to sin, but a slave mm -hmm. to righteousness yeah. Yeah. because of Jesus. Yeah. Like that whole, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. whole transference from death to light, from yeah. darkness to light, uh, yeah. of, to, from, from the, the old way to the new way, yeah. happened because of him, not because of me. I received it as a gift. Mm -hmm. And because I now see with clarity my new identity that I am in fact righteous because of Jesus, yeah. Now, what, what, what can I expect? If I expect that I'm sin waiting to happen, well then by faith, I will sin because that's yeah. what I believe. That's what I give <laughs> right. myself to. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. But if I believe that I'm righteous, then I will be actually, I will, I will live out the yeah. consequences of that faith. Yeah. And this so that's is the fruit of the spirit. That's yeah. really interesting because I had someone fight back on this this idea that you're presenting, and and it comes down to belief. And it would they would say that the the result is maybe it's not saying it the exact same way you did, but if I believe you know I'm I'm just sin waiting to happen, then I'll I'll lead to sin. So would you say that if I'm truly in the belief of you know I I believe in Christ, I believe in the gospel, then I won't do those sinful actions. Then I you know does does believing in Christ like if I'm in that state of belief is that going to prevent me from sin on the other side if I'm in sin if I if I've rejected that belief if I've you know whatever you want to call it I've rejected that belief on some in some way in my life um then sin's going to be the fruit of my life is mm -hmm. that fair or do because that's that's the pushback I've heard sure um is to clarify you know oh so if you're living in sin if you're doing these things that's evidence that instead of the fruit going to the root, the, the root is that you've lost your belief. And hmm. that if you truly believe in Christ, if you truly understand and believe the gospel and have accepted it, you wouldn't do those things anymore. Sure. Is that so would you agree with that or disagree with that? Let me let me let me try and, and spell it out this way. Uh in the old way, when I'd be living my life and then a brother or sister in good faith would come in and try and hold me accountable, would point something out in my life in a in an area where I was falling short. Yeah. Because I believe that my righteousness was dependent on my own actions, mm -hmm. the temptation was to defend myself. Because if what they're saying is true, it has dire consequences about my identity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when yeah, righteousness- like you're, you're not the person that you are saying that you are a believer. Correct. Then yeah. I'm found out to be an imposter, yeah, right? Right, yeah. So the, 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 the impulse is to say they're wrong and to deny my shortcomings in an attempt to hold on to this fleeting sense of righteousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what actually happens is I'm unable to grow because I'm unable to confront in a healthy way my shortcomings yeah. and my opportunities for growth. Yeah. yeah that's the flip said. side now is when I recognize that my righteousness and my identity is localized in Jesus and not in myself. Now, when a brother or a sister comes along and says, Hey, Justin, you know, we've been seeing this and da 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 da, I can with humility say, Wow, thank you so much for pointing that out to me because that activity is not my identity. Mm -hmm. And so sure, I can sure. with humility okay. say, yeah. man, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even realize, or maybe I did realize and I was in denial, but thank you so much. And mm -hmm. I can actually confess and I can actually repent because I'm no longer trying to cling to something that's built yeah, on my own shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's good. So so it's a state of the 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 gospel and it, living the gospel is a state of growth. It's not a state of perfection. Mm -hmm. Like to actually because you know it's it's this constant cycle of growth. Mm -hmm. And being able, like you said, to recognize there's something in your life that's not good, you'd have to be accepting the identity of Christ to notice that's not me. 100%. That's not for me. And, like and I would to offer this level it. of clarity yeah, as well. That. Yeah, absolutely. I would offer this level of clarity as well. When it talks about, when we talk about sanctification, the growth in holiness, notice this, it's not a growth towards holiness. It's not that mm -hmm. you are unholy and will eventually over a lifetime of struggle and effort and right. yeah. self-discipline and eventually get there. Yeah. 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 No, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. growth in something that I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I Absolutely. receive it as You're the identity of who I am and I actually learn mm -hmm. and I grow in, in yeah. this identity. Within, yeah. It's good. 100%, yeah. And that makes all the difference because then if I know for 100% certainty that I'm in, and there's nothing that can remove me, yeah. then now I'm free to explore what does growth in this sure, thing look like. Sure, I'm free yeah. to confront the, the the ways that I might be falling short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's Justin, cool because like, oh, yeah. 
Okay. Well, when Jesus says be perfect as my father is perfect, like that, it's a, it's an imperfect translation at least because the, the word is teleos. Oh, the irony. Yeah. yeah the, the word is teleos. It means, to, it means mature. Like it's be mature as my father is mature. And so there's even a hint of that in like when, when you could, you could take that word and say, oh, I need to be perfect. Cause then it, with that, the idea of perfect, it puts us in the space of like, we have to get to this place where our actions specifically our actions or even the desires of our heart are never bent in the wrong direction. Right. But right. what it's really calling us to is to a growth in that relationship and that maturity of what it what it means to be like Jesus mm-hmm. with Jesus that then results in a life that looks a lot more like him. And it's just sort of yeah. it's just a different perspective. It's a different way of of approaching that. I love how you were saying that it's 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 about identity. Like, because mm-hmm. it ultimately comes down to, am I building my life on like who, of who I am or am I building it off of who God says I am? Mm-hmm. And if it's off of who God says I am, then I can recognize that I'm not always living in, in accordance with that reality Yeah. as opposed to, oh no, everything that I thought I was is falling apart. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's yeah. just yeah. a completely different way. And then, and then also there's the other added benefit, um, which I just think is amazing of recognizing that that's how God sees me means that there is an, there is a continual affirmation that my, my approval in God's eyes or, or his, his heart for me is not something that I have to attain. 100%. It's not something yeah. I have to grasp yeah. for by, by my actions, but instead it's a reality that he's calling me to live within. And yeah. so, and that's just a completely different perspective of and, walking. And it leads Jesus. to such a healthier um, practice within ministry because we mm-hmm. all grew up at the the camp meetings or whatever where we heard like you know God can give you victory over drugs or porn or whatever it is mm-hmm. alcohol. And mm-hmm. I've done it for five years now because Jesus r- rescued me, gave me victory over this sin in my life. We've heard that yep. wording, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. all and like. 80% of the people in the congregation in the back of their head like, oh, I, I don't have that. I don't have yeah. victory from that. Like you yeah. kind of think yeah. about, right? Yeah. Like we, we all heard the ones like as boys we heard as, you know, when it was porn, right? Yeah. We always mm-hmm. talked about porn. Well, for you, Sean, and it like, was just, it was meth. That's what it was. <laughs> it was meth for me. It was just straight meth. I had, I had no, I was righteous in every single other area of my life. It was but just was the meth. meth that addict. Kept, from That's 10 why, years old, it just Wait, hold got on, hold me. on. For clarity, because uh, I'm new to the group. <laughs> true fair is this, is this joke not true? Is this no, no, no. That, truth? This is not true. This is slander. That's this not is true blasphemy. All. all right. Uh, <laughs> no, it's why, that's why Sean no. looked like he was 40 when he was in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't but, because but he's no. not vegetarian. It's yeah. because of the mess. <laughs> the mess. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, Sean, I do. I, I lost my focus. No, but seriously, I, I, I remember this as a kid too. You'd hear the, oh, I got victory over this. And you're in your mm-hmm. head, you're discouraged because you don't have victory over that yet. Mm-hmm. So you're, yeah. the, the belief was then I'm not in Christ. Right. Because yeah. um, our track and, record is based, or our, rather our identity is built based on, on the track, track record. record. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As opposed right, to yeah, our right. identity is built on Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and this is healthier because, well, and, and the fight back against is, oh, it doesn't still because the the again the attack against the liberal side of of, of Adventism or, or even Christianity is oh there's no tangible growth you don't see yeah. that but, or at least but you you're don't not saying to. that you can get again, away I'm, with whatever you want to do you're just free you're free you're, you're, you're free from yeah, sin so yeah. you can do whatever you want yeah. right but but obviously that's not but we, we all disagree with that that's not biblical yeah. um and and there's so many things but we it's definitely into, it's, but, that is the holdup for a lot of that's the fight against it. Is we don't, it, yeah, that it's not made. To, even if you don't believe, they'd say, even if you don't believe that, you don't tangibly make it, you know, practical yeah. enough for how yeah. to grow as a Christian. But I would actually fight back and say that the the traditional, maybe it's dangerous to say traditional, but the the yeah, the more old school way of looking at, um, you know, experiencing righteousness, that's less practical because all mm-hmm. of us were were remaining it's literally know, impossible. When, when it's yeah. sin, you you remain secretive. You you remain shameful. Yeah. And those things don't call you out of sin. They 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 make the cycle make even worse. more negative and discouraged. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. where even what we mentioned to you before we started, Matthew Gamble, we had him on. He basically got to the point where in his ministry, he was like, I don't experience victory over sin, so I don't believe in Jesus anymore. Like he lost right. his faith in Jesus yeah. over that. Yeah. I What I believe was a more traditional view of how the gospel, you know, mm-hmm. the process of salvation, sanctification, all of that works. And so this, this way of looking at things promotes not only that that ability to take a deep breath spiritually you know oh, our yeah. connection mm-hmm. to god like oh, hey yeah. you know mm-hmm. god's got me jesus jesus died for me and that that sense of the gospel but it also still does call to a greater life um and a sense of victory over the sins in your life and it doesn't mm-hmm. leave you hanging um because Amen. you can't you can't the gospel isn't powerless you can't not experience experience fruits mm-hmm. but part of that is 
hey, you know what? There are times that I've messed up. But the fact that I noticed that, the fact that I'm disgusted by sin or the fact that someone can come yeah. to me in my life or I can go to That's them a hard change. Uh, mm-hmm. is part of the sanctification process. Mm-hmm. And you can't experience Brilliant gospel without words. it. So yeah. how can we be perfect if we're not experiencing, you know, how can we expect perfection if we're not experiencing that process of yeah. growth? See, this is, this is one of those other areas where it's like, man, getting clear on what the text means by it. Like this language of perfect. I think that we do mm-hmm. a disservice when yeah. we misunderstand the idea of perfection yeah. or perfect and collapse it with perfection. Because mm-hmm. the Bible mm-hmm. does make mm-hmm. some radical claims about you sure. and I and other people in the book. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the, the adjective is perfect. Like mm-hmm. you read through Hebrews chapter 10, you're literally declared perfect mm-hmm. by yeah. God. And you're not the only one. Like Job is a man that's perfect in the sight of God and escheweth mm-hmm. evil, the King James Version, right? And there's many people throughout the Old Testament who made lots of mistakes, oh, yeah. not just Job, who are described as perfect. David. So yep. a biblical <clears throat> definition of perfect cannot be and cannot be distilled down to perfection, which is to say, I never make a mistake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Because mm-hmm. Lucifer in heaven was perfect, and yet he still led the whole rebellion. So perfection or perfect isn't uh, the state of never making another mistake again. It's being yeah. complete. It's being whole. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's a different thing. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, man, I think that when we when we when we distill down per, uh, the gospel down to this idea of perfectionism, it's like, man, that's really dangerous stuff. Because mm-hmm. then you can never actually just confess, and you can never actually repent. Yeah, because out of yeah. fear yeah. of what you're going to lose. Justin, if we circle back to the idea or <clears throat> the conversation around Adventist identity, mm-hmm. everything that you have just said. It, it may, makes me think of something you said at the beginning, which was sort of like, Adventism is not a monolith. It's mm-hmm. it's an incredibly diverse space with lots of different ways of thinking about it. And I was thinking about, you know, we had, we've had we had Ted Wilson on in the series. We've had a couple other guests. Um, and they would articulate what it means to be Adventist very differently than the way you've articulated it, uh, almost mm-hmm. from different, <laughs> different goalposts entirely. Um, and so I think really the question that I think a lot of our listeners – struggle with and questions that we've had as we talk about it and that I I have, I'm over here at the seminary at Andrews, I have all the time, every day, like kind of the similar conversation, not every single day, not every waking moment, but often with a lot of the the other <laughs> pastors studying here is the idea of like who ultimately decides, who gets to decide what an Adventist is and mm. it is there room at kind of the table of the church? Is there space if you kind of push back or dissent against the 28 fundamentals or you have one that maybe you're not sure on or, you know, mm-hmm. or like you, you're articulating it in this way. But maybe if we had Ted Wilson in the room, he would say, no, I totally disagree. That's mm-hmm. not what it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, is. Is there, and yet you would still say you're an Adventist. Mm-hmm. And so I guess the question really with for many chest. of us, w- with your chest and your biceps and your, <laughs> and your, your delts and your lats. Um, <laughs> Um, no, so yeah, well done, well done. I guess that, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, in my opinion, I mean, here, like, obviously I'm claiming one, I'm claiming one version of Adventism. In my, in my estimation, absolutely. I, I get that for others, their answer is absolutely no. And mm. so if those people ever navigate to the, the place of political prominence and they kick me out of the church, like, okay, but I'm going kicking and screaming. Mm-hmm. So I'm an Adventist, born and raised an Adventist. Like I'm committed to this church. I, I have not just the theological background of Adventism, but also the cultural background of Adventism. Yeah. Like I am a Seventh-day Adventist for better or worse. Mm-hmm. And there's a mixture of the two, right? <laughs> um, but to think that Adventism doesn't have space for diversity is just ignorant of its history. Yeah. Mm. Like think about how Adventism similar, similar, began. Yeah. It, was a, it was a confederacy of many different peoples. Mm-hmm. Mm. So from its inception, Adventism was not a monolith. Yeah. Mm. So much to the extent that if Adventism is a monolith and it has to be in full adherence to the 28, then what would you say of every Adventist that lived under the era of there only being 27? Mm. True. Mm-hmm. Because you're now in, in contradiction with each other. Yeah. So mm. just even just the way that Adventism is organized, it categorically cannot be a monolith. Well, the way that we even describe our beliefs leaves room for growth, yeah. which means there has to be space for conversation. There has to be space space for dissent. And I get that there mm. are still boundary lines. Like there are still things that make someone not an Adventist and some that makes people an Adventist. But the reality is that those lines are not very clear. Yeah. They're different for every person. What would, what would you say, say are the lines? What, what would you say are the lines according to you? Like, oh, how, man. What, what, what lines are, are yours? The, the, the Pope of Adventism had on. <laughs> yeah. 
See, th- this is where I don't like this question, and it's not because I don't like you. Uh, it's because the question is just. Okay, a I don't. Bad... I don't like me either. It's fine. <laughs> it's all the myth. Uh, it's, just a, it, it's a bad question. Like we assume so that good. the boundaries of Adventism matter. Hmm. What do you mean so, by that? In so much that we think that a, a conversation worth having is who is an Adventist and who's not, mm-hmm. means that we're having that conversation at the expense of who's in Christ and who's not. Hmm. Hmm, so okay. I think that this is inherently the challenge of Adventism is that when we when we have Adventism as a thing in our own imagination as to what it is, and it can be different for every person, mm-hmm. why is that even there mm-hmm. when the real standard is to be in Christ? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very I true. I would way rather have more conversations around that because that's actually substantive. Yeah. That actually leads to transformation. Mm-hmm. Adventism is well and good and all, and it's a beautiful faith tradition, one that I happen to invest all my time and energy every single day into supporting, into backing, into building up, and all the ways that I know how to. But I think all too often when we have conversations like this, we actually do so at the expense of the larger picture and the more important picture. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, and I hear what you're saying. I agree with you. Um, the part of the the reason that this question exists is because there is this feeling of um maybe amongst a lot of people who are in the same the same philosophical space as we are mm-hmm. um in this in 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 adventism west coast adventism maybe for lack of a yeah, better yeah i mean you could call it that i mean it maybe it's more prevalent on the west coast but just sort of more of the space of like what i see in the gospel what i see in in how jesus is leading and moving me is moving me in a different way than mm-hmm. some of the ways that we grew up if mm-hmm. you know that, that all of four of us here in this in this conversation grew mm-hmm. up mm-hmm. and yet how we grew up in our childhood is at least in my experience still the adventism defined as such by by the gc you know mm-hmm. or, or people in the gc and so there's this feeling of like uh oh like have i grown out of adventism i don't mean like past adventism i don't mean better than adventism i just mean like have i grown out of the space where i'm within the bounds of mm-hmm. that community is there no and, room for me yeah and because and i think part of it is like is there a is there a space for and and i'm asking this cuz i i i believe that there is it's just more of like how would you talk about this yeah. Is there a space then for a larger definition of Adventism? And if so, like, I mean, how do we, how do we not fall into the, 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 the path, the, the, the trap of like, it can be anything because then sure. it's nothing. Yeah. And yet, yeah. how is it still big enough for people who say like, I just, I don't see like, you know, Ellen White. Sure. She's great. I never touch it. I never touch those writings because. I just don't, I, I think if, if our whole idea is sola scriptura, um, or, uh, uh, is it sola or is it prima? I'm blanking now. It's both. Uh, anyways, it's both. Uh, but like if, if our whole idea is like we go to the Bible, then we don't need her. Like if someone might, might feel that way or like, I love Sabbath. I just have a different perspective of it than I did when I was a kid. Or mm-hmm. I love, um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I'm all about the health message, but I just don't, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm, I will eat meat, you know, every, every other day. It's like, you know, is there, what are the bounds then for those people? You yeah. know, what, I don't know. Yeah. That, that's sort of the idea. Yeah. So Jesus talks about how there's one flock and one shepherd. And as much as mm-hmm. it would pain, uh, Adventists to have to confess that one flock is not Adventism. <laughs> is not Adventism. Yeah. So this, again, yeah. this is the, this is the challenge of the Sheesh. question in, inherently is that we, so many of us, and I will raise my hand as one of the first who would absolutely have agreed with this in the past, that the one flock was in reference to the Adventism that is. But that just, it, it just cannot, categorically cannot be the case. And mm. so do I feel a certain level of burden when someone recognizes that the Spirit is causing them to move outside of the imaginary walls of Adventism and still remains in the flock? Am I pressed? Mm. My answer is no, it yeah. really isn't because I'm more interested in that person following the spirit of God than them following Adventism. Yeah. Mm, and yeah, yeah. to mm-hmm. some, God might be calling them in to Adventism as, as I happen to be a product of that. I happen to be uh, actively working in that direction so much to the extent that all my social media ministry does lead into a community that's very largely Adventist. Yeah. And 
if someone ends up feeling called to go somewhere else, like God bless you, yeah. like move in obedience and in faithfulness to the spirit of God on your life. And so mm. uh, it's just, again, like it, it's just, I get the, I get the, I get the need for the question, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I just like, man, the text is so much better than that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So l let me try to, let me try to tiptoe around an idea of like, how mm -hmm. do we define Adventism? Like <laughs> Adventism, as I understand it, is not a top-down structure. It's a bottom-up structure. Mm -hmm. So much mm -hmm. to the extent that conferences and divisions and unions and all these different things, like they are a reflection of the constituency. Mm -hmm. That the conference is in place to help to organize and codify and to reflect what people on the ground level believe. It's not from the Pope down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's really interesting. Um, if that's the case, then who defines Adventism are the Adventists. Yeah, right. Not the GC, not the NAD, not the fill in the blank conference. It's it's literally the us. We are space. Adventists. Yeah. We are the ones that yeah. to get to decide. Yeah. And so what happens when a, uh, a, a part of Adventism emerges in power that is in slightly different shade than how I would prefer? Mm -hmm. Like that's okay. Because if you were just to rewind the clock a couple decades, very likely someone else on the other side of the spectrum was mm -hmm. in power at the highest level of the church. Yeah. And other people on the other side, uh, the other people that might be on the other side of the spectrum from you felt the same mm -hmm. way you feel now. Yeah. But so, so that's my point. Like Adventism in and of itself cannot be a top-down structure because depending on the decade, Adventism from the top looks very different. Mm -hmm. So this is the inherent like risk of defining Adventism as a top-down structure. It's like yeah. it's literally malleable to the furthest extremes of what's playable within Adventism, which is just not good for anybody. Yeah, you're, you're it's saying, only good while you're while you air quotes are in power. Yeah. You're saying if it were a top-down structure, if it were that, it, correct. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying that it's not that structurally. Yeah, right. It's not that. It's a bottom-up. It's a re it's a uh, reflection of the constituency. Therefore, even if someone were in power that dis that disagrees with me or let's say that i rose to power and there's others who disagree with me i don't think it then requires you to in good faith leave the community mm -hmm. because the person at the top or the people at the top don't get to define the community at large mm -hmm. the community defines the community yeah and good. so so like I don't think that we need to really labor over who's in and who's out. That's mm -hmm. a losing game. I don't think yeah. that that's the game that we were called to play ever. Yeah. Mm. I think I, I, I agree. And I love the language you're using. And I agree with you about that idea that like the people at the local level are really the ones who are defining what Adventism is, even especially in that space. Like I, Southern California is a great example of this because South, the Southeastern California conference, like what is acceptable within Adventism here is a far cry from what's maybe acceptable in Michigan or mm -hmm. what's acceptable different in other parts of the country. What's acceptable in Norway <laughs> is completely different than what's acceptable in, in, uh, in parts of parts of the world, other parts of the world. Like it's just, it's, that's the reality. And so that is a far I feel like a far, it's like, it takes a weight off of you. Cause you're like, okay, I'm like that what's, what's defined as Adventism over there isn't necessarily more Adventism than what I'm experiencing. Yeah. I think maybe the struggle for people would be what about me when I'm stuck in this conference that I don't, yeah, I yeah. don't align, align with, with. Yeah, you 100%. know, and I'm, I'm curious even if like what you're doing is a bit of an answer to that, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, I yeah. see it as such. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is like this line of thinking. I get it. I sympathize with it. I've lived it for many, 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 many years. But it's a consequence of commercialism. That the way that I identify my role in the body of Christ is as a consumer, such mm -hmm, that if mm -hmm. the product no longer serves me, I leave. Mm. As opposed to a dynamic community that I'm a contributor to. Oh, so say like uh, yeah, the way you're good. talking about it is like, if Costco stops selling what I like, then I'm out. Right. Whereas instead of like, I'm part of Costco. I have an influence. I am Costco. What Costco does. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Costco is me. Sorry. Just the way you said <laughs> that was just like, me. you had this philosophical. I am the Polish dog. <laughs> no, but that's the idea. That's the idea. Like I, we, we like to use the language around uh, like the church is a family. And I think yeah. that's the right language to use around it. Yeah. Mm. Because if my family and I disagree about things, we can disagree about things, but I don't suddenly, I mean, I hope not. And mm. some people do this because of safety and I'm not talking about those extenuating circumstances yeah. in the least bit, mm -hmm. but we don't seriously think that the solution to grandpa voting in the opposite direction means right. that I should disown grandpa. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But we do that with church because yeah. we view it as a consumer. Yeah. Because church, for better or worse, for worse, it has become a product that people consume. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. As opposed yeah. to a community that I contribute to. Yeah. So yeah. you are hinting towards it, and I think it's actually accurate. Like one of the major reasons why I'm still an Adventist and I'm committed to the thing that I'm currently feeling led to do is because I recognize that I'm a contributor to the thing. Yeah. And and so mm -hmm, one of the mm -hmm. questions, and maybe this is the, the point in which we kind of da dance in this direction, was it intentional the way that I've placed myself in Adventism and in the world at large as a content creator? In some respects, no, because it's just an, a product of trying to say yes to whatever God calls me to do in that season. In mm -hmm. another sense, yes, because I recognize that I am Adventist mm. so that I get to have at least my own voice and yeah. influence Into on our family, on yeah. our community. Mm. And the reality mm -hmm. is if those who uh, have an ex take exception with the way that things are being run from a top-down perspective, continue to accept the lie that they are a consumer and continue to leave, well, that might work for them. But all the people that they leave behind that they actually believe are subject to something mm. that's lesser than in some meaningful and substantive way, mm -hmm. like that's just selfish mm -hmm. again not talking about you know extenuating circumstances i get why some people need to leave for a sense for of sure. safety and all okay cool yeah but part of my desire like so there's this reflection yeah. like i received the gospel at 28 even though i was in ministry for you know 15 years or whatever the number is mm -hmm. there's an opportunity in that moment to feel really jaded mm. how could i have been yeah from yeah. the moment i was born in an adventist medical center to all the way up <laughs> to where I'm at and to still be surprised by the gospel. Yeah. yeah. There's an opportunity for cynicism and then to yeah. just leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or- Because in essence, you feel like in that moment, there is this like, I had the wool pulled over my eyes this whole yeah, like time. This like thing this thing lied to me. This, mm -hmm. Yeah, this mm -hmm. can't exist within Adventism because it hasn't existed up until the moment I realized it. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a lot of people do feel that way. They're just like, this thing lied to me. Mm -hmm. It was preaching a false gospel. Right, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But this is, this is why I say like, I'm owning it. Yeah. Like I can choose to externalize the problem or I can choose to recognize, hey, Ooh. you know what? I was yeah. asleep in nearly every one of my religion classes. <laughs> <laughs> like I have ADD, I have some severe ADHD. I have some learning impediments that just yeah. actually are. And so whatever it was, maybe it was the, the, the corner of the world that I was in, it, it didn't have it. Yeah. Maybe it was antithetical to it. Maybe it did have it and I just missed it. Yeah, you're talking mm. about the gospel. like. It, the gospel. Yeah yeah. 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 So instead of just playing the blame game, I'm just going to say, you know what? My bad. Probably yeah. should have not stayed up so many nights playing Counter Strike <laughs> late at night on a school night, right? Like maybe if I would have just gone to bed so at a good. reasonable time, maybe like whatever. Civilization five was my, my end. And <laughs> total go. Rome, total war. That's yeah. <laughs> a good one. So, 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 but, so but, for me, well, oh, just here, let, me, let me tie that loop yeah, yeah. one more time. Just to say, it's like, the recognition that there's an opportunity for cynicism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I actually yeah. did go down that route for a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would strongly push back against anyone who's in that right now. Mm -hmm. And I would mm -hmm. invite you to recognize that if, if what you're observing is true, like at least in my case, people yeah. are that are in our institution need the gospel and they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. How is the logical conclusion for you to abandon them? Mm. Mm. So part of my, yep. my intention is yep. to steward my influence in such a way that I could possibly be one of the bringers of yeah. the good news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if yeah. that just means mm -hmm. that I get to have an advantage when it comes to reaching Adventists because of my cultural and because of my mm -hmm. fill in the blank, then why wouldn't I? To the Jews, I'll be a Jew. To the, Jew, to the Greeks, I'll be a Greek, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I just recognize, wow. hey, people in general need the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if it's not being preached in my family, then I, as a member of that family, have the privilege of stewarding the gospel there. If it's yeah. not yeah. being preached in my school, then I have a privilege to do it in my school. If it's yeah. not being preached in my church, then I have the privilege of being able to be that. No, I, I agree it's with a you, paradigm Justin, shift, Justin. I love it because, yeah, it's just like Anthony was saying, is like it's a paradigm shift from like, ah, that's not, they're making the bad decisions, and so I'm, I'm out. You know, I think that's sort of how it can feel. Instead, what you're saying is like, I'm part of what defines this. So mm -hmm. let me get about the work of defining it, at least yeah. to what I can do. What about it? This is this is my one pushback to my one last pushback to this is okay. if yes, that is that is absolutely true. And I fully agree with it. But it's so discouraging and energy draining. And at, ultimately, it can burn you out Yeah, yeah. when you're part of communities 
that are not either open to it mm -hmm. or actively shutting it down or um or you're just like you don't have the influence the space whatever mm -hmm. it might be or you're the only to, one yeah like you you, yeah. you move yeah. to a new yeah. community you go to all the churches and you're like yikes like there's no young people in any of these churches or whatever you know whatever it is like there's just there's no space for me to mm -hmm. be able to have a community that will be a strength to me so mm -hmm. that I can actually serve out of that space as well it's like the one thing like maybe I want to stay but I just don't have a community that that 100%. is that safe 100%. place where I can be what about those and this is close on my heart because I think about Loma Linda and like there's a really healthy community happening where we're at right now at Anthem but then when you leave this place after you graduate from medical school and you go, you go, who knows where, mm -hmm. and you're just like, oh gosh, like mm -hmm. this, this mm -hmm. is, this is, mm -hmm. there's no space for me to have safety within so that I can, I then can own it though and go sure. out some, go sure. out and start changing things. What about those? What yeah. Those people? Yeah. No, that's, that's a fantastic question. And the answer is actually really, really simple. Build a time machine. Go back 15 <laughs> years and be a canvasser instead of a camp kid. There it is. <laughs> oh, because I felt it coming. one thing that canvassing has taught me is rejection and the feeling of being alone. Mm, and that's, yeah. that's a joke, but that's, that's also true. Like yeah. there's a guy who echoed that sentiment, Anthony. I'm mm. the only one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the response from the Lord was what? Yeah, you're, you're about not the only one. Yeah. You're, you're not. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly there's it. 7, 000, 8, 000 7, 000 others. You've that's done. exactly yeah. it. And so, so I think that this this is this is the direction. And obviously, I'm, I'm making light of it, but I actually really s resonate with that challenge. Um, Are you essentially saying that, that that that's a myth? Essentially, Justin, like the, the that's feeling of aloneness. Mm -hmm. well, no, no, the feeling is there. The feeling is true. The right, feeling right. Yeah, is yeah. it is what it is. Obviously, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the feeling is built off a of belief, mm -hmm. and the belief is that I'm by myself. Yeah. The belief yeah, is I'm that the there's one. no one else. Yeah. And you might have good reasons for that belief, like mm -hmm. Elijah, yeah, who just doesn't see things from the Lord's perspective. Like there's a good reason for his yeah. belief that he's the mm -hmm. only one. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that you're not. Yeah, you're not. The truth is that you're not. Yeah. And so, Dang. so to move with that trust and to move with the confidence that you are not the only one. Mm -hmm. And as long as you continue to accept the belief, I'm being very gentle with my words. In my in my faith community on Bible studies, we would just call it outright a lie. That's a lie. You're <laughs> believing a lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as long as you give power to the lie, you will only be able to see the lie. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But the that more that you give yourself yes. over to the truth that you are not alone and that there are people yeah. that 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 have for years, like this is what my, blows my mind is that at one level, in the cynical level of me receiving the gospel, the cynical side is like, man, no one, no one ever has ever yeah. heard this before. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And when I believed that, that's all I saw. Yeah. But mm -hmm. when I started to to mature in this understanding and to realize, no, God's spirit, because because if yeah. no one else is mm -hmm. is believing it, then that's an indictment against the Holy Spirit, because it's mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit's job to yeah. to build to bear fruit. Mission yeah. of God. So yeah. I'm actually blaming God. Yeah. Without, without intending to, that's what I'm actually doing. Yeah, so true. when I realized that I'm not the only one and God opened my eyes, I actually saw people who were in my life the entire time who did have, now maybe they didn't have the preciseness and the, the, the language uh, articulation, or, yeah. the articulation yeah. of <laughs> language in the way that I would have preferred and would have been able to receive. Yeah. But in their heart of hearts, they had been walking in this in the entire time. Huh. So, Man, so you're, you're advocating that um, just like when you're like, I'm going to sin, you know, like that's where you find yourself. It's the same thing when you, when you're, when you're operating out of that belief system, which may feel true, like, and feel, and, and then cause you to feel lonely as a result of that belief system. You're saying that like the spirit of God is actively moving and has been active for a lot longer than you've been around. Mm -hmm. So there, there are people, whether it's in your circle or at least people to be found who are actively living in that space. Maybe yes. even from our conversation, we would say not all of them are going to be Adventists potentially where you go. There 100%. might be, you might be finding a faith community that isn't Adventist, but yet at the same time, maybe divorcing yourself from Adventism is, is not necessarily the answer. You know, granted there's, there's definitely like, you know, every situation is different, but maybe we shouldn't get there that easily because we actually get to define it. Yeah. You know, so that's sort of the, maybe the, the trajectory of what we've talked about put into. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, I'll just, I'll show my cards and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. I, I don't know the three of you guys very well. Anthony, I know a little bit, but yeah. what I know about Anthony is really suspect because he plays Timo. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I don't know. We're how much can about I actually... League of Legends. 
I mean, so, so my point being is that like, I know you guys at best at a surface level, Yeah. but what I'm, what I'm hearing from you as I'm hearing your story and as we get to have this conversation is that there's a, there's a strong degree of agreement with what, what's being shared today. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think that you're just being kind. I think yeah. that you are being kind, but I think that at some meaningful level, we're connecting at least on some of the overarching themes, maybe the yeah. nuances of it, you, we would do differently, but the overarching theme we're connecting mm. on. I would have never known that had mm. I not had this conversation with you guys. Yeah, yeah. So I might have felt I'm the only one. Yeah. Woe is yeah, me. Yeah. And lo and behold, in one morning or one afternoon for you guys, I have three new brothers that I'm like, you know what? Yeah. There's yeah, some yeah. dope people out in their parts of the world that like God is working through. For and sure. if I ever have somebody that's in their corner of the world, I can be like, you know what? Go go check them out. They're yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. power of just being open to this thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Justin, to to kind of close out our conversation, I just wanted to ask um, a little bit about the future of Adventism. Um, and what's funny is we're asking all these questions, and I fully agree. Like the bigger conversation is about is about being in Christ and like helping people to find that space of of religion. But just for the sake of like for those of us who find ourselves in the family of Adventism, like what do you see as some steps the church um, can take or should take? Uh, in the future to to be able to continue to be a healthy expression of the body of Christ? Yeah. One of the movements that I've been enamored with for the better part of a decade um, has been minimalism. I remember mm. watching my first minimalism documentary and then following Matt Diavella and all the YouTubers who are espousing the, the benefits of minimalism. And so I, I got caught up in that a lot. And as I understand minimalism, it's not get rid of all your things because things are bad. It's more being able to identify the things that make life worthwhile mm. and being able to be unashamed at saying, this is what I'm about yeah. to the exclusion of the other things. Mm -hmm. So minimalism isn't things are bad. It's that there are things that are really good yeah. and being about those things. Mm -hmm. What my hope for Adventism would be is that there'd be a willingness to explore what actually is beautiful and what's actually true with a capital T mm. and being willing to double down on that thing. Yeah. Not because the other things don't matter, but because the one thing supersedes in every respect and outshines everything else. Um, one of my conversations online, and I know that we were intending to talk about these things, but you know, such as the, the, the podcast, one of the conversations that I had online was with my friend, Matt Whitman, uh, from the 10 minute Bible hour, got yeah. to invite him over to my local church when I was living in Portland, give him a little bit of tour on his kind of like touring different denominations, uh, yeah. YouTube show kind of a thing. And he's like, you know what, actually there's a, like pretty much everything except for that weird investigative judgment thing. <laughs> like I'm, I'm down with like everything that y'all are putting on the list. Yeah. He's like, but I just find it a weird list. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like that modesty and dress is on the same list as the resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> I said, Oh my God. Like that's, yeah. that's a different way to look at it. Yeah. 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 Right. I wonder if maybe not in the actual list itself, maybe it's impractical to distill the list down, yeah. but at least in the, the preeminence in our hearts and in our imaginations, would we, would we be better off? If we pare down the list, not because the things don't matter, yeah. but because only one thing does. Mm -hmm. And what would we, how would, how would the world be better off? How would our church be better off? How would our communities and our families be better off if we were known as the people of that one thing rather than the 28 things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Seeking What They Sought. Before we rush to a close, wanted to just pause and say thank you. We are really, really grateful for you all, not only for listening, but for all the conversations that we've been having recently uh, from emails and messages, DMs, uh, text messages you've sent us if you know us. Uh, we are just really, really grateful for those conversations. They're the reason we did this podcast and uh, we're just really, really uh, grateful for you all. So please, if you haven't, if you have thoughts and you haven't reached out, uh, please uh, send us an email um, or send us uh, just a DM on Instagram or, uh, or, you know, drop a comment under one of the 
one of the posts. We would love to have conversations and uh, hear what you think. Now, if you didn't know, we actually have a Patreon. Uh, it's something that we mentioned uh, during the off season, but we really, really wanted to up the ante and be a little more intentional, a little more professional uh, going forward with this new series and going forward with the podcast in general. So we have started a Patreon. There are some fun, cool perks that you get for signing up. It's going a long way to, to help us make more content like this uh, for you guys, and we, we really appreciate it. So if you want to support us, you can hit up the Patreon. There's a link in our, our, our bio on Instagram, and uh, we would be really, really grateful. Well, I think that's just about it. So we will see you guys next time on Seeking What They Saw.